And I'm joined by Carol Hodge. How are you doing, Carol, mate? Hello. I am very well. Thank you. No, good, good to have you on, mate. So I uh, appreciate your time. Um, and thank you for, you know, sending your, your new single, Gross Sin Over Maneuvers, uh, last week, uh, which came out. Was it the 12th of April that came out? Correct. Yes. A couple yeah. of weeks ago. Nice one. Uh, so, you know, great track. It's, you know, got great, it's always received, received great reviews I've seen online, got a great response when we played it. So, where did that song in particular come from? Um, well, it was kind of a collaboration with uh, Rob Heilig. Um, he wrote the guitar part, and um, I decided to temper it with a bit more of a sort of dreamy chorus because it's basically like a really heavy guitar riff that is centered <laughs> around. Um, so yeah, and like lyrically, it's um, it's about people being duplicitous, particularly the way they present themselves in the online world, um, and how frustrating it is that people just can't be um, transparent and honest in the way they communicate with others. No fair play. I mean, I think that's something that we'd all like from more from people when we it's certainly something that I, well, any human interaction is normally cloaks and daggers to a certain degree, especially online when you're like you say, getting told one thing and and it's not necessarily the case. Yeah. I just find it like really fascinating that the way people communicate online is so different to how they would communicate face to face. Like the things people say mm. uh, and the way they treat each other um, it just wouldn't happen in a real life interaction, but people just feel emboldened because you know they're hiding behind a screen um, to just be really um, unkind, yeah. um, to put it lightly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is it. I, like you say, when the, the for want of a better term, the keyboard warrior syndrome comes out, and people you know do do that, and like you say, they would say things online or type things that they wouldn't ever say to your face when there would be. I guess a risk, some might say, of uh, them getting some sort of repercussion for saying those things. Yeah, um, <laughs> and like just, a, just like general a like mild manliness. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, you just don't say certain things um, because you like to think we're in a, a modern, forward-thinking society. But sometimes that's hard to believe. Yeah. Well, the, the danger with it is, and what is just happening more and more is that people are more and more divided, and there's no space for discussion anywhere. Because yeah. people are so entrenched in, like, they believe a certain thing that they can't even listen to somebody else's opinion. Um, and that always cuts both ways. Because I always think, as passionate as I am about believing something and standing up for something, there will be someone else who is equally as passionate about the exact opposite thing yeah, or is as equally passionately against what I am for. Um, and, yeah, it's that's just life it is life. <laughs> that's what the world is. is and yeah the more we avoid discussion and just throw confrontational um you know sound bites at each other the further away we are from any sort of reconciliation or um you know compromise or harmony i totally agree with you mate and like you say it's that thing where you know people are going to have different of opinions that's life it's it's just the way of the world it's never a personal attack i've got friends who you know, I love to bits, but when they talk about certain things, I think, yeah, you, you've got it all wrong here, mate. And I'm sure they think the same about me, but it doesn't mean I'm going to get into a slagging match with them or suddenly not be mates with them anymore. And I can't go for a drink with them. It's just a difference of opinion. But you, like you say, it seems to be on an online thing of it It goes beyond just someone going, well, I disagree with you. It's like yeah. it's, they, they take it as a personal attack and then it's a personal assault almost when it isn't. It's just a disagreement on that particular subject, whatever it might be. And a lot of times when you see it online, it is about the most mundane stuff that doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, things tend to get blown out of proportion, don't they? And people mm. choose people choose quite odd hills to die on. <laughs> um, but at the same time, it's it's kind of like you, you've got to... Is I I often think at the moment, um, in my opinion, the people who are fighting the hardest for freedom of speech are the people who have the most um, unpalatable opinions and want a right to express them. Um, and as much as I disagree with that and their opinions, I do actually um, support their right to espouse them. So there's all that as well. Um but yeah, it's just, I mean, the song itself is kind of inspired by a couple of people in particular, um, mm -hmm. but just generally as well by 
you know, anything from politicians saying they're going to do one thing or they <laughs> are one thing and they're com the complete opposite and you can't believe a word they say to just the levels of narcissism that you encounter every time you open social media and just, you know, it's artifice and you know that these people aren't that in real life, but it's, um, it just seems completely inescapable at the moment. It just seems everywhere. There's no truth that people are just maneuvering away from it or maneuvering around it to present something else. Seemed to be like you were saying that you wrote that with Rob. Did you do, was that a, a planned writing session as such, or was that just something that came through when, you know, that was, um, a pretty last minute um like we'd wanted to do a song together for a while and i just mm. said hey i'm going in the studio in two weeks if you've got anything i can use and he just sent me this riff and i was like yeah i can use that brilliant um which is kind of in terms of collaboration it's it's kind of my favorite way to work is if you do a bit of a back and forth as opposed to um being in a room together and coming up with ideas can be brilliant but can be quite tedious and can be quite difficult. Whereas if I'm just sort of left on my own to work on something that someone else has started, I, I usually find I can finish it quite quickly. That's cool. I mean, like you say, there was there was a complete contrast between the chorus and the verse. You have got that gnarly stomping riff in there and that kind of like floaty side of it as well, which I really like the contrast in there. It doesn't sound like a cut and paste job, but you know, I mean, it does feed into each other nicely, but there is that definite contrast and light and shade in that and you normally get that across an album and you've certainly had that on your previous records but to have it in one song i thought was pretty cool thank you yeah that was the exact intention because i think any idea that you have musically um if you just stick with the same thing it does get a bit boring and a bit predictable i think it's always i'm always trying to walk that line between um well, first of all, what do I want to hear? That's always the most important thing because yeah. that's what I have to go with. Like, what do I like? <laughs> um, and then it's like, is it is it predictable? Um, is it too predictable or is it predictable enough? And you're always trying to negotiate around those things because it's got to be enough to hook someone in, but then maybe go in a slightly different direction that they weren't anticipating um, at some point in the song, yeah. you know. So I take it this is this is separate to the album that came out last year, though, isn't it? You got yeah, yeah. So this is the opening track for my my new album, which is recorded and is is waiting to be released. Um, aiming for like sort of September October this year. Oh, nice. So because the other like your previous album that had uh, again that was very eclectic in itself. Some stuff was verging on kind of you know a lot of synth loops in it and that kind of thing and then stuff was sort of more folky some very more punk rock but is it you does maneuvers set a vibe for the rest of the record i guess is what i'm asking because your last record was quite eclectic in its sounding yeah so it's it's the opening track on the album and it's definitely the heaviest track as well um so there are other songs that that kind of stray into that territory um what I wanted to do with this album, it's my fifth studio album. Um, I've been listening, revisiting a lot of like stoner rock that I really liked from the 90s. Nice. Um, so I've got so, a lot of Caius in this track, to be fair. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So I'm kind of like, I want to I wanna keep it within that world. So in terms of the production and in terms of um, the arrangement and the songwriting to an extent, it is more, it feels more cohesive. It feels like every track bar maybe one <laughs> just now i'm thinking like maybe three of them no um they're all they all feel like they're in the same world and i and i worked really hard to to do that on this one um while still trying to keep um the sense of a journey throughout the album yeah. as opposed to every song sounding very similar um I, li I like to kind of take people on a bit of a a bit of a roller coaster um and i think it still does that but more within one genre this time nice so did you change like your approach to um writing on this record compared with you know um campaign with her traditional jobs well i did um a few songs i, I wrote on guitar which i've oh. never done before like i'm a i'm a piano player and i tend to write on piano hmm. um but i'm one of my uh, patrons very kindly sent me a guitar. Oh, um, cool. So uh, I've been playing that and I borrowed a bass from a friend as well. So I've been, you know, improving my guitar and bass skills 
So just writing on different instruments has, has changed the vibe and it's yeah, just like different ideas have come out through doing that. Um, so it's the first time I've ever had my guitar playing on an album. That's cool. Um, so there's a couple of songs that have got a bit of my guitar on. And I, I didn't anticipate that. I, I just recorded the demos and took them in the studio and assumed that Dave Draper, the producer, he that he because he always plays guitar on my albums, I thought he'd yeah. just do it. Uh, and he was like, no, let's keep it. That sounds great. I was like, okay. <laughs> so wasn't expecting that. Oh, nice. I didn't realise Dave was working on this album as well. So that's cool. I knew he'd yeah. worked previously, but I didn't know he was actually working on the, on the forthcoming as well. That's quite good. Yeah, and it's it's the first album that my uh, the Carol Hodge band have actually um, done some some arranging and playing on as well. So that's been a a really nice process. So Piper Dawes, the guitarist, and Nikki Conton and the bassist. And um, we had a couple of sessions where I we sort of worked together. You know, I had I had a demo that was just vocals and piano, and we worked to create the finished um, sound. Oh. You know, with like drums, bass, and guitar as well. Yeah. So that was a that was really fun fun way of collaborating. Did you feel that that like sort of fed into the sort of energy of the album a bit better than gave it a kind of a more of a live feel or? Um, it was kind of like, because I'd already done a session by that point. So I already had sort of like seven tracks that were, you know, pretty much almost there. Yeah. Um, And so it gave them like the world of the album, like they knew what world they were slotting into. So it's kind of like the other way around. It was like, oh, yeah. here's what the rest of it sounds like do something like this so um <laughs> it's quite yeah it was really nice the way it worked, worked out and we're gonna do those songs live and um like a few other ones from the album we started playing in rehearsal so um no oh, nice. yeah, exciting that's cool so you said you're looking for a sort of september release did you say sorry yeah i'm still um i mean because i do everything myself mm. um part of me is considering like trying to work with a label on this release but there's also part of me just wondering if that's um, not necessary. So I'm just, I'm still weighing <laughs> it up at the moment. Once I get back from tour um, next month, then um, I'll have a proper look at things. And because obviously, I, you know, I need to get things to pressing plants, etc. Um, yeah. If I'm going to make September or October. Yeah, like you say, there's a long sort of waiting list on those things at the moment. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 kind of settled down now. Um, most places. Are saying about a twelve-week turnaround, but that's from when you, um, when the artwork and everything gets approved and the audio gets approved, um, and there's often like a test pressing coming in somewhere in that process that then needs to be approved. So it's always, you know, I always give try and give it about four months. So that's not long. <laughs> <laughs> no, the same goes past. Yeah, you talk about live notes there, but when when is that the uh, the tour that you got coming up? Uh, later this year with Julia or is that separate to that sorry yeah well I'm I'm going to um Mexico and um America in in a couple of weeks with Steve Ignorant so we're, we're over oh. there doing like um the crash songs nice. um and then I think when I get back from that I'll I'll figure out what I'm doing with the album but yeah I am touring I'm doing a solo tour with uh, Julia Othma from the US um in June and July in the UK um so that's kind of my my personal like focus at the moment, as well as getting the album, you know, ready to release. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to that. I've been friends with Julia for a few years now, and um, she's a sort of similar world to me um, in that she's a singer songwriter. She sings and she plays piano. Um, so for this tour, we're both going to have a piano each on stage throughout. We're going to do some duets, do some. Oh, solo songs and we've been writing like um a batch of like brand new songs for the tour as well um oh what was a collaboration yeah some collaboratively and some we're just taking like um a prompt each month to write a song oh, okay. um and then you know sort of comparing notes and figuring out what bits i'll do and on her song and etc and then oh, nice. at the moment we're halfway through doing a back and forth on a couple of songs where we're sort of writing them together but obviously the the Atlantic is between us. So um it's kind of a, a virtual thing, but it seems to be working really well. It's it's a interesting process for me. I was gonna say, how have you found that as an experience of bouncing back and forth ideas with Julia? Yeah, it's great. I mean, she's like I, she's somebody I admire massively. I think she's hugely talented. Um and just 
you know, on a personal level, like she's somebody that I really look up to. Um, so it's it's just been the perfect um, balance of, I feel I'm getting a lot from her. I'm benefiting and I'm learning yeah. from her and her process and how she approaches things. And she seems to feel the same way about me. Oh, that's cool. So that's like, it's just that lovely, you yeah. know, like symb- symbiotic thing. It's not like, because sometimes in a collaboration, like relationship, one person does a lot of the heavy lifting yeah. and the other person just dips in and out. Whereas it feels like we're both really invested in it, um, which is, yeah, really, really nice. That's really cool that you've got that sort of relationship, even like you say, even though the Atlantic is between you, that you, you've you got that uh, chemistry. Because I've, I've, I've played bass myself and, and I've been in and out of bands and stuff. And, you know, I've certainly been in the room physically with people where I don't have that, let, let alone sort of doing it virtually. Yeah, I mean, it's hard enough, isn't it, to try and get four people in a rehearsal room once a month or whatever it is. <laughs> Just like the logistics of that, it seems to be harder to do that. <laughs> than to write with somebody who's like thousands of miles away so yeah i hear you on that absolutely so um how was the how did the tour itself come together then was that julia was going to come over here anyway was it something you guys were talking about like sort of for a while or well we wanted to do something last year and it never really came to fruition we did one gig together and then sort of after that we carried on talking and we were like let's really you know throw throw ourselves at it and get it sorted so in and with gig booking as well it's all about doing everything at least six months in advance and really sort of strategizing and thinking ahead yeah. um so i'm quite proud of what i mean i did all the gig booking and it took a really long time um but it made me appreciate you know every gig i get asked to do like <laughs> somebody's booked that and somebody's promoting that and it just gave me a, a fresh appreciation for um, just how hard it is, how hard it is to get a gig, how hard it is to promote a gig and how hard it is to get people along to anything. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to um, promoting that tour a bit more. And so I'm starting to rehearse for it now as well. Um, and, uh, yeah, it'll it'll just be nice to do something like the two of us. I think just spending a couple of weeks with Julia will be a, like a really fun experience anyway. Absolutely, mate. Sounds like good. I mean, you got a hell of a run of dates. I was looking at them earlier, and it's not, you know, it's not, it's not a, a small tour by any means. It's, it's quite a lot of dates you're doing over in those couple of weeks. So it'll be a, a good run of shows. Yeah, yeah, and it'll be nice to sort of, uh, you know, show Julia more of the UK as well. I mean, we're playing places like, I mean, like Huddersfield, um, like Derby, Dundee, my fod in wales like places you wouldn't necessarily go to as an as an american tourist so it'd be nice to take her off the beaten track a little bit that's where you find the gems mate off the beaten track so absolutely i mean dundee that's like i love dundee great <laughs> so, yeah had a great gig there with ginger like earlier on this year so yeah it'd be nice yeah. to go back well no perhaps off to you mate because as, as well as the radio show I, I run my festival in fact uh the reason i was at the, the norwich gig we mentioned earlier was because at that time um, it was uh, we were supposed to have Ginger Wildheart and the Sinners playing my show, and that was obviously before Ginger went and took his his break while he got himself uh, well mm. again, which is absolutely you know right and right. And I was said that as soon as I got the call, I just get him, just make sure the guys pay. You know that's that's the first and foremost. Um, yeah. So yeah, whenever I see a, uh, and I know the uh, the logistics of organising one one show once a year, and so when I see a, a run of dates like you've done yourself, mate, off the, for this tour with Julia, hats off to you, mate. <laughs> Oh, th- I mean, now we've just got to get people along, you know, <laughs> and it's that, <laughs> it's that thing, isn't it? It's like, it's um somebody, I'm friends with um Paul Morricone, who's in Scaramanga 6, and he does, he's just released an amazing solo album, which I happen to sing on a couple of the tracks, but it's, it's brilliant. I just think he's, he's like one of my favourite artists around at the moment. Um, But we were chatting about that thing of like, when you book a gig and how how strange it is and how unnerving it is to keep asking people to come and see you and you feel you just feel a bit awkward about it I mean I do anyway some people are, are just completely you know they're just yeah. machines and they're constantly plugging and plugging what they do and they don't seem to have any sort of anxiety about <laughs> it which is I wish it was more like that to be honest um but he said it's like inviting um people to your birthday party and then because there's that thing of you get really worried about is anyone actually going to show up? Yeah. And then there's the whole thing about well, 
isn't it quite egotistical that I want people to come to my birthday party and celebrate me? Yeah. Um, and you get kind of all tangled up in your brain with all this stuff of, about like, well, why would anyone want to come and see me? Like, it's just an exercise in like ego pampering. Um, and yeah, you can get yourself tied up in knots about it. Um, but basically, yeah, come and see us because <laughs> <laughs> it'll be great. And Julia is amazing. And um, yeah, like I've, I've said a few times, like just her doing one song is worth the entry price alone. So I'll just sit there quietly and let her do her thing and everyone will be happy. <laughs> Sounds like it's going to be a nice collaborative set, though, if you all like okay, we did the whole back and forth thing and and then the sort of working together throughout the show as well. If you can have that's what's going to be cool. Yeah, we wanted it to be a little bit like um like a songwriter's circle type feel. Um so we are we're discussing like the songwriting process and like the stories behind some of the songs. Um and there'll be a bit of like audience participation. We're gonna write a song with the audience on the awesome. night, so it'll be different every time. Like uh, and there's a couple of gigs that we're running, like songwriting workshops beforehand. Oh, sweet. It's like part of it. Um, so yeah, just just something a bit different for me, and I and I like that approach of um, trying to see a tour as as an event and a one off, as opposed to like, oh, Carol's playing again. Yeah. Um, it's like, oh, well, she's doing this thing and she's never going to do it again. So you know, hopefully, it's more enticing to fit people to come and be part of it because it's not going to happen again. So yeah. That's really cool. I like that you um like you say like you're mixing it up and you're making it a uh, an event rather than a, a gig for one of a better term. You know, it's uh, it's a, each gig being that bit special. Yeah, yeah, and I think that's. I mean, that's what we wanted to do, um, and I think it's uh, it, it's good to. It, it's a great project for pushing us both as artists. It's pushing us both forward and helping us go out of our comfort zones and try something new. Um, I mean, because to be honest, at this point. The idea of improvising a song uh, in front of an audience is is quite terrifying. I should imagine, so, um, this, yeah. But you know, uh, why not? What's the worst that can happen? I mess it up, and then I still get to, you know, go home afterwards. Not, you know, yeah. not gonna not gonna burst into flames because I can't think of a rhyme off the top of my head. So yeah, it's fine. <laughs> Helps people see the other side of the coin because I think some people think that anyone can, you know, anyone can write songs, anyone can come up with a piano lick or a guitar riff or a drum part or whatever, you know, and, you know, there's, especially with the way musicians were and artists and of any description were trapped during lockdown, you know, there that kind of integrity was kind of stripped away in terms of the public eye while well, just, you know, go retrain and go do something else, go do something, you know, almost like it wasn't worthwhile where the yeah. arts is anyone with half a brain knows is what puts the color into the world. And yeah, it can function in black and white, but it's not as fun. Yeah, no, that's a really nice way of looking at it. Um, and I, yeah, I wrote a song about that exact thing on on my third album. Um, and yeah, just the idea of it not being not being treated with uh like the reverence and respect it deserves. Yeah. And I know I know you know being a musician's not as important as being um a surgeon. I'm not claiming for a second that it is. Nobody's gonna um potentially die if I don't do a gig. Um. But like you say, we people take for granted that, um, you know, everything they watch on TV, everything they hear on the radio, everything they see that's vaguely creative when they go online, it's it's all come from somebody's time and effort. Um, and that's how people want to make a living. They want to be, you know, rewarded for yeah. their creation that's in helping other people or bringing some sort of pleasure to other people. Um yeah, and like you say, if we didn't have it, it, people would really, people would really feel it if all of a sudden there was no, no art of any description being created anymore. So. Oh, absolutely. I mean, my wife's an artist. Um, that's what she does. Self-employed has done for, us sort of eight nine years, and you know, so she's doing that sort of creativity. I've got my radio show and my festival and and everything else that I do, and I couldn't live without art of any description. I mean, we all kind of had to during lockdown, and I think there was a reason that you know that covered with being trapped inside while people got depressed so yeah yeah no, no, no theaters no music no physical art no galleries that you could go visit or anything like that i think when that gets taken away and anything that you know challenges your emotions your political opinions or opinions of anything that art can challenge you on i think that it's important to keep it going so yeah absolutely 
Yeah. And I, I just think now, like, is as much as possible, just going and doing things is like, is a really rewarding activity. Whether yeah. it's, you know, just like you say, going to an art gallery for free or uh, going out hiking, which is yeah. also free, um, or going to a gig or going to the theatre or just anything at all that involves you, like getting off your sofa and yeah. going and doing something that is only going to happen once. I, I just think that's that's what we need to be doing more of. No, absolutely. So well, as we're talking, you know, we were we were talking there about, you know, you know, you're influencing and that kind of thing. But I'm always interested when I speak to people. Where where did your music journey start, mate? What was the moment where you you started playing keys, or you know, was it keys keys that you started playing first? Was it singing? Was it you know? Yeah, what? it was. It was. It's always been uh, keyboards for me. Um, and I was um, one of. I mean, people have this stereotype of like people's parents forcing them to learn piano when they're a kid. That was always like a a thing of like you will go to piano lessons but I was the other way around I had to beg my parents for piano lessons like I really really wanted to learn um and I think it all came from um, my brother got this really tiny little Casio keyboard at a car boot sale and he played with it for about a week and then he got bored of it and I just sort of picked it up and started playing it and I just got really obsessed with it and I think my parents recognized like, oh she's actually she's picked that up really quickly like she's um She's got an aptitude for it. And yeah. then I bought a book, and this is when I was like eight. Uh, I bought a book with my pocket money and taught myself how to read music. Oh, wow. um, and then I got a couple of other sort of keyboard books and then saved up all my pocket money for a year and got like a full, like a four octave full size key keyboard and then kept playing that and kept getting better. And then I think my parents were like, okay, this isn't just a fad that yeah. she's going to get bored of. Like, she actually really wants to do this. So they relented and let me go to uh, lessons. That's nice that they, they, they've, they um, you know, acknowledged that, you know, it wasn't a, a fad and it wasn't a passing thing. Because it's just when you're a kid, it, it could easily be deemed to be. I know, you know, I started playing bass at 12, you know, and that started as... Um, just like my dad's record collection really i just, I always liked the low end of that guitar i thought it was a guitar you know i was a kid i didn't know yeah. what a bass was but it was geezer butler i was listening to it was john paul jones it was you know phil liner it wasn't any of anyone else it was that deeper sort of sound that i always loved and then a mate of mine when i got to well because i was kind of like the loner kid because i liked rock music and everyone else was listening to like backstreet boys or whatever the hell was going on when i was yeah and i was there listening to like you know my dad told me to see aerosmith when i was 11 and three colors red and bands like that and you know and everyone else is going Who, who's three colors red and i'm like okay i you need to learn this stuff <laughs> um so i was always kind of the weird kid until my mate max came um to school uh he joined the school sort of halfway through and he was into his rock as well and he was the first person i knew that sort of played guitar um, and like I say, we were sort of the outcast kids and we used to go into like the music room in school and Max was there and he'd mm. bring his guitar and he would play and there was this old sort of what what now? I wish I'd because the teacher said I could take it and I wish I had because it was like a 1950s Fender Precision it was beat up to hell Oh wow! Um, and it needed any set of strings on it and a bit of, bit of love and care but I remember like just Max saying well you know pick that up and you know we'll just I'll teach you something and uh, I think we learned like Offspring or something and as soon as I plugged nice. it in, I was, it was just like, yeah, this is what I want to do. And I kept handing my parents, so I started doing this with Max at the lunchtime. And even my dad, who was into his music, was like, right, okay, mate. And then it was like, right, you go out and earn half of it and we'll we'll match your sort of thing. And then after a while, they realized that I was going around doing every job I could and, and finding every little way I could to little jobs yeah. around, around, the, around the village and all that sort of thing to make money. And they kind of went... Okay, he is serious about this. So they did go and find me a place. But I remember my teacher saying, like, oh, you can take that if you want. It's been in that cupboard for years and just trying to be a bit of a shy kid at the time. I was just like, no, it's all right. So I've got one, you know, and yeah. I kind of wish I'd taken him up on it now. Oh, amazing. <laughs> yeah, isn't it funny? And it's often, um, like in my experience, a lot of the people um, that I meet, oh, hang on. Sorry. Can't hear anything all of a sudden. Can you still hear me? I've got you. Okay. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, yeah, a lot of the people that I meet, um, they're from a similar sort of uh, a similar sort of socio-political background, and um, we're also 
the weird kid at school or the person who didn't fit in and like you, you gravitate towards the other weird kids and you end up liking you know you end up liking the same music uh, but yeah I remember being at primary school and everybody was like really into take that <laughs> and I was just like I was listening to like Queen a lot of the time yeah. and um I, I was just I didn't understand and I just thought like, cause it, but all my friends were putting so much pressure on me, and I was just like, "Do I just have to choose one of them that I say I like more than the <laughs> others?" And I, then that kind of, you know, that sort of pacified them, and I could just, I didn't have to know anything about the music, thankfully, because <laughs> I, I didn't really like it. So, but yeah, it's weird, isn't it? How it, um, especially like alternative music, mm. it, it really was. I mean, that um, smashed the um, Offspring album. Yeah. That was one of the big albums for me that just really resonated with me as a teenager and made me feel like um i'm not not alone in the world there's other people who feel and can articulate that like frustration at not fitting in um yeah. and that's all right and it just sort of you know by proxy it gives you an outlet just oh, by listening to that absolutely. music you know like i said i was i was the weird kid and then i say my dad took me to see aerosmith when i was 11 um wembley stadium and, and three colors red were opening up and i remember them coming and storming it and that was the first time I heard Three Colors Red, and I was like, fuck. You know, well, whatever the 11-year-old equivalent of fuck is. But that's what I thought. And I just remember, like, looking around at the old Wembley Stadium, and I remember looking around and seeing there's thousands of people, and I'm thinking, well, I'm not wrong, <laughs> because there's, you know, a few thousand people here who are enjoying this. Yeah, but it's I'm... not just me. It's weird for liking this yeah. sort of music, yeah. And that was definitely a turning point, and that was the kind of thing I kind of... I always said I saw, I went in this little shy 11-year-old kid who quite like some of his dad's music and I came out with bands that I hadn't heard through my dad a couple of support bands that are on another I really enjoyed and I came out really not sort of giving a shit anymore because yeah transformed I, yeah you know I've been I've been heavily bullied because I had epilepsy as a kid so I was kind of labeled as the as the weird kid anyway because mm. I had epilepsy and I had you know kid, older kids now trying to kick me into having a fit and all that kind of thing for their own amusement or whatever and so at that point in life I kind of thought well, they're going to take the piss anyway. I might as well just enjoy what I enjoy and, and like what I like. Yeah, and that's what I mean. And they, and it helps with your with your defiance and the forming mm. of your own identity and and just being just having the confidence to be like, actually, I'm at the point now where I don't I don't care as much what you say and what you think of me and what you what you do to me because I've got this other thing yeah. that's that's letting me um letting me know I'm not alone, and that's what especially as a teenager, that's what you need in the world. You need to know you're not the only person who feels a certain way or thinks a certain way. Because it's hard enough, isn't it, being a teenager? God, yeah. I wouldn't want to go, wanna back go back there. there. Mm, me neither. <laughs> <laughs> you talked about Offspring Smash there, but was there any other sort of defining albums for, for you? Yeah, I mean, the ones that stick out, I mean, Green Day was my first big love, so mm. uh, Dookie. Um, they, were like, they were like my band when I was like 13. Um and I went back and like the local record shop I managed to order like the albums before that, the ones that were on Lookout Records. Oh, yeah. Um and then through that, um, because I got like inserts from Lookout Records, like I discovered bands like Operation Ivy. Oh nice. Yeah. Um and like Pansy Division, um who else was there? Um I can't even think now. Um, but yeah, so those like like for, for me it was kind of like the American American pop punk very much. Yeah. So it was those. And then things like um well, Trouble Gun by Therapy was a huge one for me. Fucking one of the best albums of all time. Uh, I still time. absolutely love it. It's perfect. Um Me and um my wife were travelling back from Cornwall uh, a couple of weeks back. And my wife's a big therapy fan as well. And it's it's tend to be my I am having to drive at four in the morning. I now need to, a burst of energy album. And yeah. It's, and it's like, it doesn't matter what time of day it is. It's me and wife's, you know, screaming along, I scream anger and stuff. And it was just like, it's the, it, we put it on and I probably haven't listened to it fully for, for a couple of years, baby. Probably since I saw him do the anniversary tour the other year. And um, yeah, both me and my wife were driving back from Cornwall. They're like blasting out at four in the morning. We're like, if anyone else is driving past us, we must just look insane right now. <laughs> Like yeah, said, so, still got it. Absolutely. Those, cool. those albums from then as well, you realise that you know every single word and you don't yeah. think about it until it comes on, but you just automatically yeah. just sing the whole thing. Um so they were they were big ones. Uh weirdly, uh, Fishing for Luckies by the Wild Hearts oh, yeah. was a massive album for me. 
um i remember using uh some of schizophonic in an a in an a level uh drama nice. project that i did <laughs> um and oh, what else was there Oh, re- no doubt. I was really into No Doubt. I was the first band I was in when I was fifteen. We covered quite a few No Doubt songs, mm-hmm. um, and we, like you know, like obviously like Nirvana, um, Hole. Um, I quite liked you know some of the, I quite like Blur, um, mm-hmm. like the Brit pop stuff, um, and I was really into. Um, oh, I'm just trying to think, just like unlocking bits of my brain. Uh, oh, the bends by Radiohead was oh, a big gee, album yeah, yeah. as well. Um, yeah, so all that. Oh, Soundgarden as well, like super unknown. Like that was that was huge. Yeah, because um, yeah. it was it was diff. I feel like it was. Diff- I mean, I'm 42 now, and I feel like that getting into music in the 90s, it was it was a lot more limited because you you know it's like you, you couldn't just turn the radio on and hear this alternative stuff. I mean, I. I I got into a lot of bands through having MTV, yeah. um, and then, you know, me and my mates would like sort of get together and be like, right, you go and buy that album, and then I'll copy it. I'll buy this one, and you can <laughs> copy it. And we had this little sort of pool of people going. Because it was like fifteen quid a CD, and when you're like fourteen years old, that's a lot of money. That's like a you know, for me, that was like three weeks pocket money. So, um, yeah, it was kind of like beg, steal, or borrow. Like anything any way you can get hold of these albums and just do it yeah i was i was really lucky on that front like i said my dad was really into his music and so i'm i'm 36 so i'm a little not same ballpark but a little bit younger than you and you know you'd have been a teenager but i was i was lucky that like my dad like people say oh your dad brought you up on old school rock and old school metal and i'm like it wasn't old school at the time i was like seven listening to nirvana and pearl jam and mud honey and yeah that was that was yeah contemporary <laughs> yeah and stp and skunk and Nancy and stuff you know oh i loved skunk and Nancy. yeah oh, yeah absolutely. you know and i remember like you know then i got to like 14 and i was at high school and there's you know kids running up to us that, that had started to get into rock and stuff when by the time you kind of get to high school in those teenage years and coming up to me and go, oh mate, have you heard Nirvana? And I'm like, have you heard Alice in Chains? Have you heard Mud Honey? Have you heard, you know, Screaming Trees? You know, like they're they're trying to sort of enlighten me with Nevermind. And I'm like, please listen to Dirt. <laughs> please yeah, listen to people yeah. I've known. Please. You want to hear the people who influenced Nirvana? Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, but I was I was just really lucky, you know, it was just in our household. Like my my mom was like the complete opposite, you know. My mom, my dad was into rock and blues and grunge and stuff, and then my mom was like very much like Prince and George Michael and Pet Shop Boys Love Prince. and all that side of things. So, yeah. but like that was the thing. Like growing up in my house, so music was just music. I just gravitated towards what my dad was listening to more so than my mom. Not not completely because love Prince, you know. But and sometimes say oh, there's some other stuff she liked, like Duran Duran and Cure and stuff like that. But mum liked the more poppy side of Cure, whereas I went into more like disintegration and stuff like that. But yeah, yeah. When they, when they got very dark. Yeah, but it's just funny how where you pick things up from sometimes. Like my mate Max, I was saying about who was like the other weird kid at school who was into rock music. He just picked mm-hmm. it up. <laughs> like, he didn't have a dad who was into it or an uncle or a big cousin or an older brother or anything. He just was flicking through somewhere, heard Guns N' Roses and went down a rabbit hole, which, like I say, when I met him and like when we were like sort of 11 or 12 in 1998, it's not like you can go down a YouTube rabbit hole. In yeah, so yeah. I, don't really well, remember. I remember like um uh, getting smash hits magazine when i was a kid and that would have it would have like the lyrics to songs that were in the top 40 yeah. and that's how i first heard of nirvana because they had like the the lyrics to smells like teen spirit printed yeah. in it that makes sense. um and i you know i've got a brother who's like four years older than me so he was into i mean he got into like hip-hop and rap and stuff and then he got into um like alternative um music so i just i would literally like sneak into his bedroom when he was out and like get a tape that he copied off someone else and go and copy it in my room that's how i got <laughs> hold of the had a tape that was uh smash on one side by offspring yeah. and uh trouble gum on the other side and it was a copied tape that he'd nice. already copied off someone else <laughs> so that was like my gateway was uh you know waiting for him to go out at the weekend and then just like you know going and gathering stuff and copying as much as I could as quickly as possible. <laughs> so I didn't get battered when he got home and caught me in the act. So, yeah. 
Well, you're talking about the amongst you, you know, the the albums that were influenced. Obviously, you mentioned the Wild Hearts, and obviously, you know, you worked with Ginger for a number of years now. But how how did that start off with Ginger? Obviously, I saw you with Ginger last year, but I know you've you know done several tours of him and and, and worked with him for quite a while. Yeah, I um got. I got asked, he, apparently he was, he was looking for a keyboard player when he was doing the Ginger Wild Heart Band, and that would have been 20, 2016 it was. Mm. So, yeah, about eight years ago. And uh, my mate Kel, who um, sings in uh, and plays bass in a band called The Empty Page, oh, yeah. um, she was doing backing vocals in the Ginger Wild Heart Band, and she recommended me to him, and I just got this email, and I thought, oh, I'm going to have to go and audition and stuff. And it was just like... Kel says you're great. Do you want to be in my band? And I was like, nice. um, okay. I was like, oh my god, it's Ginger Wild Heart from the Wild Hearts. Um, yeah. So I did that with them then, and then we yeah we've done a few things like over the years, uh, and then yeah, me, him, and John Poole did a couple of tours, um, a few years ago, and then when he was do- starting to do the acoustic thing, um, yeah, he just uh, well he he asked me he wanted me to do it. Um, and he wanted Ben to do it as well. Um, and so our booking agent suggested that me and Ben do something together so we can both do it. I was just like, all right, yeah, we'll do a we'll do a duet thing. So um but that that was, you know, just so much fun that tour. And I have to say now, when I do gigs and there's not a dog um <laughs> either on stage or in the dressing room, I, I just feel like there's something missing. Like it's such a beautiful experience touring with Maggie. Um a lovely dog, aren't you? Yeah, and it's it's it is like she just brings a different energy to, you know, to to the room or to the van. She's just like, yeah, it's just great having it having a dog, especially her, because she's just like, you know, this magical being of pure light, which yeah. is always nice to be around. Actually, I mean, I've always been a bit of a dog person myself, and when we went up to the waterfront, um, I walked upstairs in the studio to go to the studio room. And in my head, I, I didn't know, you know, whether you have an act on, like I say, it was obviously due to have Ginger Wildheart and the Sinners on, on the bill. And whether you have an act on the bill and you go to gig, you know, I, I appreciate it. People are working. You never know if you're actually going to get the chance to say, hello, thanks for playing, or you're going to have to email them later and say, you know, great show. And I never take that with anything because I appreciate, you know, there's fans in the room who want to talk to them as well. It's not just about whether I put them for a gig or not. But I literally walked up the stairs and suddenly, you know, I didn't click at first. There was just this, you know, border collie sat at my feet and i was sort of like oh hello and i'm, I'm a dog person so i sort of naturally saw ben down and making a fuss with the dog and i was like oh she's and then suddenly i clicked i was like hang on i think this is maggie and then i sort of yeah. looked up and i heard a voice say i was like oh sorry mate she's got out of dressing room and i sort of looked up and, and ginger was there like so we had a bit of a chat but yeah yeah she's a lovely dog <laughs> i can see why uh i can see why he has her on the on the road that's for sure oh yeah she just yeah she just chills everybody out and yeah it's just uh it's good vibes when Maggie Wildheart is involved. <laughs> Sounds good. So what does the, the rest of the year, other than the tour and also the album, um, hold out for you, mate? Um, well, I'm doing... Uh, I'm going back to America again with uh, Steve Ignorant. We're doing um, a festival in Los Angeles in June. Um, and before that, I'm going to be um, somehow involved in the the wild hearts gig at the oh, nice. uh at shepherd's bush empire and um then got the tour with julia i'm playing rebellion festival in august doing the craft songs with steve at that and i'm playing a solo set acoustic on the acoustic stage oh cool you're uh, doing rebellion eh? say again you're doing both at rebellion are you both with steve and yeah yeah um and then what else am I doing? I'm trying to get to some more gigs for uh, the Carol Hodge Band. So we're playing a few gigs. We're playing a Crap Fest uh, with the band The Crapsons in Birkenhead in July. Nice. We're playing um, Off The Tracks Festival. Um, and then we're playing a Resolution Festival in September. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, yeah, hopefully Julia's coming back again in November. And we're going to do something else together. Oh, brilliant. Um, and then, yeah, there's potentially another tour before the end of the year um so yeah i've got qu- quite a lot coming up which is which is nice to sort of look ahead and be like all right okay the next uh you know seven or eight months i've got i'm just looking at my gig calendar here and i'm just like yeah i've got i've got quite a lot to keep me out, out of mischief so um so that's uh that's something to be grateful for going back to europe with steve as well and then we've got some more uk gigs um later on in the year so yeah 
nice to have fingers in different pies and be doing different projects and um yeah variety is is definitely a, a fun thing for me <laughs> absolutely it sounds like you got a hell of a rest of the year ahead babe yeah it'll be great yeah so, I, you know i wouldn't change it for the world there's nothing i'd rather be doing than uh writing and recording and performing music so yeah well this is it this is what you want out of life and and while you got the like you say the gigs you got lined up the you know the forthcoming album um, I love the fact how, you know, quickly you've got another album coming out after, you know, you've got your previous album out last year. Did you use the same, do you record from home then or did you? I, uh, so my process is I record um, my vocals and the um, the keys at home. Um, and then I usually record, you know, like ideas for like drums and bass and guitar at home as well. And yeah. then take that into the studio with Dave, and we sort of, um, you know, final finalize like drum parts. He usually records like the bass and guitar, um, and yeah, it's just a. I like doing the vocals in particular at home because it's just less pressure, yeah. um, and um, it means I can take my time with things, and um, that but that process is often. <laughs> Until until I've got the final song, you know, because obviously if I'm doing the vocals for something and I think it's going to be a piano and vocal song, but then we take it in the studio and it ends up being like a big rock song with like drums, bass and guitar, then obviously my vocal performance is going to have to be revisited yeah, in terms of like the energy and the dynamics. So, um, so it's kind of like a bit of a, you know, back and forth sort of process. But um, yeah, I do like being able to take time over things um, and, and that's always the um, the tightrope you're sort of walking as an artist, especially somebody who's independent. Like you've got you've got to consider like finances and how much things cost. And it's not cheap to record an album, and it's not cheap to manufacture an album, particularly on vinyl. Um, so I'm always trying to sort of find that balance between like how can I make it sound and look um, as amazing as possible, um, but also doing that within a budget that I actually have because I don't have, you know, I can't magic money out of the air. I've just got to work with what I've got. So, yeah, of course. So, uh, with with speaking of the album, obviously, you say you're looking at sort of later on release this year. Have you got your eyes set on releasing any more singles in the meantime? Is Anubis just going to be a, a teaser for now? Yeah, I've got another um, another music video has been filmed. Oh, nice. And, um, video for Anubis, by the way, was awesome. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that was uh, Rob Rob Heilig again. He wrote the guitar riff. He's a very talented boy. Um, and so, yeah, so he's filmed the next uh, music video, which is being edited at the moment. He's um, currently on tour. Um, in He's just left Australia and gone to America now. So <laughs> <laughs> um, it's going to be a little while before that's finished. Um, and then, uh, yeah, release that and probably a third um single and video before the album gets released uh just because it's fun um and yeah just making music videos and having um having the time and space to do that and collaborating with a videographer is is like really good fun so um yeah more of that i didn't do that at all in my last album i didn't do any music videos and i kind of regret it so i want to make sure i'm just you know creating a visual world for this one as well as the um audio world when you're doing your videos, do you try and do it as a visual piece to the sort of lyrical themes, or do you just go in and have fun and, and see, or in the case of Rob's working on it, does does he come up with the ideas and it's interesting to see someone else's perspective on it? Well, well for manoeuvres, um, I just had this idea of these, I've got these like resuscitation mask things for like, mm. basically like resuscitation dolls, but, but for children, oh, right, like yeah. of children, like so little baby faces that you're breathe into whatever when you're practicing your res resuscitation skills as you do on a friday um <laughs> and um i just they're just really creepy so we went to uh, the lake district and i was like oh why don't we just film some weird stuff of these like masks like in in nature um and then so the initial idea was like let's just do loads of weird shots in black and white and just create yeah. um a quite a disturbing kind of video that doesn't make any sense and then when we got into it, we were like, well, we'd be quite good if it had some sort of narrative because it just suddenly felt like it needed a story because it was just too abstract. 
Um, so yeah, so we just sort of pieced together a narrative and then you know sort of filmed once we had a more a more solid idea of what to what to include. Yeah, nice one, mate. Well, yeah, I'm looking forward to hearing the rest of the album, mate. I'm, you know, liking what I'm hearing from the was Looking forward to the rest of the album. And uh, yeah, I'll have to get along to this tour with Julia. Um, we'll check the dates and see which ones I can make. And uh, I'll have to come down because it sounds like it's going to be a good evening there. Yeah, it will be. Like I say, just come and see her, honestly. I, I will also be there, but it's all about her. She's amazing. So yeah. <laughs> but when we have the interview, we'll obviously um, push the, the dates again like we did the other week. But uh, that goes without saying, just so everyone can, uh, anyone who's listening to this now can go go check out the dates and see where the closest one is. Brilliant. Yeah, I appreciate that. That'd be great. No worries at all. Thanks for your time, Carol. It's been great to chat to yeah. you, mate. No uh, worries. No, and so, so at the beginning of the interview, I'm going to play Manoeuvres with it being your latest single. But cool. what song of yours would you like us to play at the end of the interview? Um, Maybe do The Price with okay. the one with Ginger on it off my last album. So, yeah. But what no, thanks it? for your time, man. It's been great to chat to you. You too. Lovely to see you. Yes. Take care. Bye. 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 Thank <laughs> you.